So field. Yes. I got to ask, you know, okay. would you? Would you? Well, I asked first. I asked second. W- would you? 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 This is Indecent Proposal. Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Butler. And I'm Mike Field. And this is Forgotten Cinema. Each episode, we highlight a film that, for a variety of reasons, was forgotten by audiences. Whether it be because a more popular movie was released at the same time, or the film simply didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the movie, maybe don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit it. You never know, you might find your own forgotten gem. If you enjoy Forgotten Cinema, we want to hear from you. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. We're available on all platforms with a backlog of over 200 episodes for your listening and viewing pleasure. Season 18, they said it wouldn't happen. The adventure continues. I don't know know who said said it wouldn't wouldn't happen, happen, but I'd like to to think somebody out there said it wouldn't happen. We showed them. Yeah. We did 13 episodes. And this is... (laughs) And this one's a supersized season. 15? 15 because there's one extra, 15 because there's an extra. This one's going to go through Halloween. That's our favorite forgotten horse. Do I'm not... You know what? I'm not even going to say the uh, title of it yet, right? Should we even know what the Forgotten Horse 6 title is? It's going to be Forgotten Horse 6, but I don't even know what the subtitle is yet. I think we decided, but we haven't... I don't know, revealing it. Yeah, we haven't revealed it yet, yeah. So we're so this yeah this season that Forgotten Horror is in the season and I think we're doing six episodes right six episodes five yeah. that are part of the main show and that I'm part of the because there's five Wednesdays in, in October, October and then one that's going to come out on Halloween which we did last year for Forgotten Horror five which I think went well so I think yeah, yeah, yeah. and and Butler loves Forgotten Horror so the more it's fun to do it's Butler. fun to do the audio intros and now we have the video I might try to do some video stuff I don't know it, it it's fun but like if nobody. My thing with the if no one if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there no, to hear it doesn't it's make not sound. that if nobody knows what the original opening is and they just go to one of your forgotten horrors that like not even those openings that's like they probably have no idea what's going on. I'm okay with that. Okay, <laughs> all right. We're trying to attract. It's viewers. fun. It's spooky. It's fun. <laughs> they do well. All right, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Uh, except that I'm broke. Um, and uh, I went to the casino to gamble the last of my money that you played, borrowed from your dad. That I borrowed from my dad and played. The um some of the worst casino games that give you the worst odds that you could play. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean exactly. Exactly. Why roulette? Yeah. It turns out, you know, I was up twenty five hundred bucks, which is great, or twenty five thousand dollars, which is amazing. And then I lost it all. How do you day. stay playing roulette when you're losing? You get off the table and go do something. Well, first, go back to the craps. Yeah. First it was all craps, which I guess uh, has okay odds. But still, you were winning there. Why it, would you leave that and then go to roulette? Yeah. Dumb. <laughs> we're talking about a decent proposal that's not even yeah i didn't even get even to i didn't finish plot. my day <laughs> sorry well we'll figure that out uh i'm gonna get to the facts and then we'll get into asking mike if he would let elise uh sleep with a rich man and uh be done with it and decent proposal <laughs> <laughs> we'll be done with it. that's the whole reason we that's did it. this episode I am just, gonna, just to ask but the question I, I hope you're watching and listening to this episode because this entire episode is going to be <laughs> convincing mike to let you sleep with a billionaire <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's it. Season 18 starting hot. <laughs> it takes a proposal as a runtime of 117 minutes. It's rated R. Production budget of $38 million. It came out on April 9th, 1993. Butler was five. Correct? And this was my favorite movie. No, Actually, you were four. Because your birthday's on May 19th. No, you're born in 87. Yeah, so I, I so was five. five. I was 18. I was about to graduate high school. Old mm, man. Good old days. Don't old man. That's you, please. You wish you were back. We were alive back then. Okay. The good old days. Movies were good. Movies were better. Oh, uh, yeah. They were. They were. <laughs> uh, everyone says that. But yeah, no, they were. <laughs> I mean, I mean, in a couple of months, I'm about to experience Jurassic Park in the theater. I, I watched Jurassic like, Park in the theater. And I experienced Jurassic Park in the theater with like packed house of like 500 people. People cheering. You didn't get that. I got that. My parents took me like we I'm left school. Now. I'm getting really belligerent this episode. <laughs> left school, went to the theater, just watched Jurassic Park. So, I mean, yeah. like it was so awesome. Our worlds are about to be blown in A two months. months. Yeah. Three months. Yeah. Good times. Good times. This movie had an opening box office weekend of $18 million. 
Domestic total was 107 million. International 160 million for a worldwide total of 267 million dollars. So this was well. A lot of people needed to know what happened. Oh, I think they found out. Um, uh, you know what? I'm going to, you know what? I'll, let me, I'll get to this fact right now. Mike, this is the sixth highest grossing film of 1993. Wow. Six. Can you name the top five? The Jurassic Park. Number one with $915 million. Jurassic Park. I d- you just said it. I yeah, said oh, number oh, one. Oh, you're, okay. I gave it to you. Okay. Yeah. Four more. <sighs> 93. Do you want me to give you hints? Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I mean, okay, all right. I'm five back then. I didn't kill my wife. Oh, the fugitive. There you go. Number three. Number three with 369 million. I really don't want to give a hint for this next one because it's really rude, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so I won't give the hint I usually give. I will say that number two is a comedy. Okay, number two is a comedy that stars Robin Williams. 1993. But Robin Williams, like you've never seen him before. The Birdcage? No, nope. No. Robin Williams, that like you've never, never seen him before. before. Did he start playing bad guys back then? No, no. It's a comedy. Oh, you did say it was a comedy. Oh, Mrs. Doubtfire. Yes, Mrs. Doubtfire with four hundred and forty-one okay. million. As a late. So that's number two. The future is number three. Four and five. Butler. Four is a hardcore drama. Hardcore drama. Philadelphia story? No, Philadelphia uh, story is not. No, you're thinking of Philadelphia. Philadelphia. I nope. was called Philadelphia story. Uh, war drama. You got number one, Jurassic Park. It's not Saving Private Ryan. That's not that no, old. No, that's, that's 98 because it lost the best picture to Shakespeare, Shakespeare in Love, Love which yeah. was BS. Yep. Jurassic Park, directed by Steven Spielberg. And then he also directed. Oh, he did Schindler's List the same year. Yes. That's right. Schindler's List at 321 million. So number five, Butler. Number five star has Wilford Brimley in it. Cocoon. Nope. Cocoon 2. Kicking the crap out of Ethan Hunt. Come on. Magnolia? No. no. Magnolia? That's like know. 2001. Kicking the crap out of our our lovely Tom Cruise, who goes down south to Memphis, based on a really popular book, goes down to Memphis. Oh, is it the- uh, You're getting there. Outsiders? No. no. Wow, The Outsiders in the 80s. That's what I thought was the outsider. Gene Hackman. Produces his wife. I don't know. The Firm. Oh, I've never seen the. You've firm. never seen the firm. I know about it, but oh, yeah, I've never man. actually seen the. We firm. gotta watch the firm. Yeah, I always forget. I always confuse the firm with the other one where the kid witnesses the murder. So Wilford Brimley in the firm is like the the tough guy kind of thing. <laughs> he like he kicks, he beats up Tom Cruise. I'm like what? But um, yeah. Oh man, you should <laughs> watch Wilford the firm. Brimley. You need to watch the firm. Gene Hackman, Gene Triplehorn, uh, Tom Cruise, Wilford Brimley. Come on, you got to get into the firm. Sounds Holly like, Hunter. Sounds like we're putting the firm on the list. Season 19, The Firm. So those are the top five, and then obviously this film was top six. So let's get back to the facts, but I thought that was good. I like that. I like doing that. There's a lot of good movies. It is. I mean, come on. 1993 was stacked. Uh, This film was doesn't have really a production company, more like just a producer. So this film was distributed by Paramount Pictures. Said it came out on April 9th, which was a Friday. So the week before April 2nd, 1993, you had a wide release, The Adventures of Huck Finn, starring Elijah Wood. I like that movie. The Crush, which is... Very similar in sexual themed undertones as this film. Who's in the crush? Really? Um, I, do the I, crush is with uh, Alicia Silverstone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Carrie Elwes. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Cop and a Half with Burt Reynolds <laughs> and Jack the Bear with um, Danny DeVito. Yep. This film, uh, the ninth. So let's go back to the ninth where the Indecent Proposal came out. It went up against in a wide release, The Sandlot. Um, so that's. that's the What's the Sandlot? Con- San- really? Oh, yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Your limited release of Sidekicks and This Boy's Life. The 16th, the week after, wide release of Boiling Point, and then a limited release of Benny and June, No Place to Hide, and Wide Sargasso Sea. So, I mean, it's just the end of the spring or beginning of the spring. Summer's coming. So, right. This wasn't when, like, nowadays March brings out all the big films. Well, back then, fast, Memorial Day. Ever since kind of Fast and it. Furious came out in April. That's when all of a sudden, like, there's always that one big film in April. And then when, like, the Hunger Matrix- Games started Arch, March. Well, that's when well March remember, because the Matrix came out in March and that, back in 99. Did that, that start it? Because yes. I thought that was just like a fluke. No, well, that like- was the thing. Like, the, it came out, I remember watching it and I was like blown away. But like that, and then the, I think the second film got a March release or something. Uh, Bla- was yeah. Blade also March? I don't know. I thought we did, I thought we had an episode, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't so that know. that was around yeah. Blade. 
So yeah, so it's always funny how it pushes back. Okay, this film was directed by Adrian Lyne. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with Adrian Lyne, but Adrian Lyne's a lot of his films are are like similar to this film. Erotic thrillers. Yes, exactly. He was nominated for an Oscar for directing Fatal Attraction, which is obviously a very popular one. Bunny gone. <laughs> Flash Dance, <laughs> uh, Lolita, and Nine and a Half Weeks. Written by Amy Holden Jones. This is based on a novel by Jack Engelhard. Uh, it's the novel is way way different than this movie because the novel actually dives into Arab and Jewish relations because one uh, I think uh, the Gage character is is I think he's Arab and and um, Demi Moore's character is Jewish Jewish yeah and it deals all, it, it's like really like it's not like this film at all it's just kind of like the premise you read the book no I've read about just the read the book okay. no uh, I just got the spark notes Come Amy on. Holden Jones has written Mystic Pizza Beethoven all the Beethoven well no Beethoven but like she gets the credits for the other one because she based the characters on them and then the relic the horror movie the relic Cinematographer was Howard Atherton, who's done Bad Boys, Deep Rising, and Mermaids. Composer was John Barry, who uh, has won a slew of Oscars. Uh, Lion in the Winter, Out of Africa, Dances with Wolves, Born Free, actually won two in Born Free, one for Song and Best Score, and Mary Queen of Scots. So uh, quite quite a lot of movies there. Is he also the one who created the James Bond theme? I don't have that note, but very well, maybe. I really think John Barry, I think he did. You could look it up. Want me to look it up? Yes. Right now? Yes. Uh, no, Monty Norman did uh, uh, the James Bond theme. And I didn't have to look that up at all. There was no cut. There was no cut. No cut at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one movie edited by Joe Hutching. Hutching? Hutsing. Excuse me. Joe Hutching. Eh, whatever. Uh, I'm sorry, Joe. Um, he won. Two, I shouldn't be sorry. He's nominated for four Oscars. Won two. Good job, man. Wow. Uh, he won for Born on the Fourth of July and JFK. He was nominated for Jerry Maguire and almost Famous. Produced by Sherry Lansing, who also produced Fatal Attraction, and it was nominated for Best Picture, so she has an Academy Award nomination under her belt, and she also uh, produced Black Rain. This film stars the very debonair and sexy Robert Redford <laughs> as John Gage, our million, our billionaire or millionaire. Uh, he has been nominated for an Oscar for The Sting. He won for Ordinary People. He's uh, been in The Natural, All the President's Men. He started the Sundance uh, Film Festival. Because um, he was butch. He butch casting the Sundance Kid. Yeah, he is, uh, you know, he's, he's Gatsby. Great. He's the great. original Gatsby. Gatsby. Yep. Demi Moore is Diana Murphy. She's G.I. Jane, Ghost, St. Elmo's Fire, and A Few Good Men, to name a few. Uh -huh. Woody Harrelson is <laughs> David Murphy. TV show True Detective, White Man Can't Jump, which is an episode we did, and Natural Born Killers. Uh, Seymour Castle as William Shackelford. He was nominated for an Oscar for Faces. He's also in Rushmore, In the Soup, and Honeymoon in Vegas. Oliver Platt as Jeremy. He is Diana and David's uh, lawyer. Uh, Shackelford, uh, Seymour Castle's character, is John Gage's, not really his driver. He's his right-hand man. Kind of yeah. Thing. yeah. Uh, Platt was in Lake Placid by Centennial Man and the Three Musketeers. Billy Bob Thornton, for a hot second, is in this film as Day Tripper. <laughs> he has one of the funnier lines in the movie. Um, so you see him there. He's won an Oscar for Sling Blade, obviously. Uh, he was in A Simple Plan, which we did. Yes. Um, and Armageddon. Rip Taylor's in there for another hot second as... Uh, Diana's boss at the real estate agent. That was Rip Taylor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, he, he, you've seen him. He's a comedian on a lot of variety shows. He's, he's more of just like the Rip Taylor character. It's not like he's never, like, this is like probably one of the very few movies. Billy Connolly. Connolly. Connolly's in it. Yeah. Billy, what's funny is <laughs> Billy Connolly's in this as himself, but in the, in the, in the, uh, credits. credits, he's listed as auction MC. You couldn't just say himself. <laughs> So he's in there and he's in the X-Files. I want to believe we'll always pump that. He's also in Timeline, which is the episode we did. Yes, it is. And one of our funnier commercials. Um, <laughs> I'm actually proud of that commercial because I was able to do a split screen thing. That was very uh, cool. Thank you. And he also is the, we should redo that. He's also in uh, the Boondock Saints. <laughs> okay, Mike, you've never seen this film. <laughs> no, I I think most people my age, we use the term. I think even people like in your generation use the term. That's an indecent proposal. Or whatever. Like everybody knows what the movie is about, the basis of the movie. But I don't think anyone... I don't think not anyone. Obviously, the movie did buco books, but like I don't think anybody around my age or whatever has gone back and seen the movie. We just all know what the plot it, is. It's it's in the it's, it's synonymous in, the in pop culture. Yeah. yeah, you kind of know what it is, but you've never seen it. Yeah, yeah. So I am yeah. one of those people. Okay, so you've never <laughs> seen this. I had seen this when I was younger. Um, what's funny is like this is probably the first time I've ever watched it from start to finish. Oh, really? Okay, right. And um, the the whole thing when he like, hey, you mind letting me your wife and. They write the contract up and stuff like that. For some reason, in the back of my head, I and I think it's from the line that he says to her, we won't do anything you don't want to do. When he says that line to her before he kisses sure, her. Sure, yeah. I always 
I always had it in my head that the night it was never like them. They and obviously they sleep together, but that was the whole arrangement. He was he was basically signing a contract with them to have sex with his wife. Yeah, and but I never thinking like I ever because of that line, I always thought it was just like. I just want to, ha- I want to be with you one night. If sex happens. It happens. It's not necessarily, that's what's going to happen. You know what I mean? Like I always thought that. Right. Yeah. I never. I forgot that it was just straight up. We're going to have sex. Right. Like, so I, so when that happened, I was like, Oh, I, I remember that wrong. Okay. You know, <laughs> it was basically cause it was just so front and center kind of sure. thing. Sure. Cause like when David, uh, says he's like he he's asking he's pushing her. Did you do it? Like he's not asking, did you do it? But also really, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> He's not, I, I'm trying to make a point here and you're just being immature. Is this what the whole episode is going to be about? <laughs> so um, he's making a point that um, like, was it any good? Not did you do it? That's obviously what happened. Like, right. You know what I mean? So, but that was my thing. I'm curious what you thought of this because you had never seen this before. Going into it. I mean, like I said, I, I knew of the movie. Um, I always thought that's what the movie was about. I didn't think that would happen, you know, 55 minutes into the movie, this two hour movie. And then the movie would be about the repercussions of that night. I always thought it was about the will they, won't they? So I was kind of surprised about that. I I like that about it. Um, But I, I like this movie. It was way different than I thought it was going to be. I was expecting like an erotic thriller kind Mm -hmm. of a thing. And it's, it ends nice. Robert Redford's character is not as big of a douche as like, which is, which is, which was, was him. He pushed for that. Did, did yes. he? Okay. Um, he actually reminded me of Gatsby. Like if Gatsby didn't get yes. shot and killed, like yeah. he's playing Gatsby. Yeah. But yeah, I, I was really surprised about a lot of the movie. Like uh, granted, it's got a lot of awkward moments that make me feel uncomfortable because as we all know, <laughs> I don't like feeling uncomfortable. And awkward. Ooh, what parts? Just, ooh, like the what whole parts made you feel uncomfortable. The whole him waiting to see if she'd do it. And like, as, as his buddy Jeremy's oh, talking yeah. to him in the Tiki lounge, which, that Tiki Lounge looks awesome. I want to go there. Uh, I'm sure. That, really? I, I, my note is like, wow, this restaurant's mildly offensive when they had. Oh, yeah. There. I was like, oh, boy. The big Buddha starts talking. <laughs> like other parts of it were cool. Yeah. It no, kind of no. reminded me of. That was Casa, the only part. That was the yeah. only part that was like. Kind of reminded me of like Casa Bonita from. <laughs> <laughs> but like when he's there and he's freaking out and then he's he goes to the horse race. And the, I thought this was kind of weird because it's the only time they really do it. But like he's in the horse. Everyone's doing the horse race uh, betting. And then all of a sudden the TVs switch to her get his wife getting railed. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, that's weird because they don't pull that kind of like imaginary shtick again. Well, that's what he's thinking. Yeah. 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 Um, and then he runs after the, he goes into the room. He doesn't find him. He goes up to the helicopter and they just go away. It's like that hole is like, like, oh, I just like, oh, so squirm, squeamish. Oh, it's so awkward. Uh, so th- I think that was like the biggest part where I was just like, oh, I don't like this at all. Like, this is, <laughs> ugh, ugh. The rest of it, though, I think is OK. Oh, and when he comes, when he when he visits them drunk. Uh, when he's he like, I, up I, on the I switched to the cuckoo because, you know, he doesn't. I'm like, oh, this is so awkward. You're such a loser. And I'm yeah. just like, Ugh, I feel uncomfortable watching this scene. So, yeah. So your point, like you, like I said, when you were talking about it, is that Redford's wanted to wanted the gauge character not be so the villain he and 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 i think that's more interesting i yeah, like that and so yeah so there was a lot of uh comments on on that change that he had made uh, even the screenwriter had come out and said you know this was a movie written by men for like that like so they were changing things and and, and redford's note about making gauge gauge less of a villain i understand why it's i understand why you would want to make him the villain because it's such a you're that rich. You can buy anything you want. And she calls him on it. Sure. You know what I mean? And I think that that's, that's an archetype that we know already. Maybe now, maybe not back then, but now 30 years later. Yeah, well, that's yeah. Right. So, so yeah. Watching it now in 2024, right. I would find that boring, but I think it's, it's it definitely a bit more interesting when the guy is, you kind of like the guy, you know what I mean? And, right. And, and, and I, I will say though, that I will say that everything in this film, I thought, not that it was realistic, but it was played on the level in terms of writing, in terms of uh, acting and the, and the, and the, and the, and the scenes together and the dialogues and the fights and the conversations. All that. It was played on the level. The only part I didn't like was at the end of the film 
when he does his million dollar club line to her at the Catalina wine mixer. You mean? No, 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 no. <laughs> at, well, after that, because she in the car ride home and the car right after. Oh, I like the car right no, after. No, see, but this is the, this is my problem. This is my this is my only thing. And, and okay, you, feel free to disagree with this. No, okay, I just did the million dollar <laughs> club convo. It's interesting. It's it's obvious that he's pushing her away, and he tells there is no million dollar club. Yeah, right, he tells Shaka for Layla like, because she would never look at me the way she looked at him. And she knows it and she thanks him for it. But the problem is that like when she thanks him for it, it's like he's giving her permission to leave. But it, but, but she never it really should it's her be life. her decision. Sure. Right. So so she shouldn't need Gage's blessing. I don't think it's I, it, I don't think she's thanking him for that. I no, think she's thanking him for. No, I, I'm not. I'm well, not. I'm not saying I'm not saying she's not. She's not I'm saying not in the, the subtext. Sure. Not in the script. She's not thanking him for that. She's thanking him for, you know, a, basically agreeing for with him, me, knowing what she he sees. Right. Yeah. That he sees that she's in love with him and she would and, and she's like, thank you. Like, so she doesn't have to have the fight. Sure. But the problem is that it takes away her power. Like this should be her decision to leave. And it makes her a supporting member in her own story. But I feel like she already made that decision and he's just making it easier, kind of. Like not easier, right. but he's he's doing his best to kind of be like, well, I can see you want to go like here. This is here you go. Like, but not he's not get necessarily giving her permission because I feel like regardless of if he tried to keep her or not in that scene, she would have been like, no, stop the car. The, the stop the, stopping the car and getting out was going to happen no matter what. Right. But then it, but it would have been her saying, I'm leaving you. And it, it, I'm talking about subtext, not in the I'm not in the script. It's not like these actions. Sure. I'm talking about in general. You just mean like to have her do it would have given her more power. It, it would have it would have it would empower the decision more and it would have, it would have made her more of a lead in her own story. Whereas he's not a lead. He's just supporting. And I get it. It's probably from Redford. Like, I don't want to be the bad guy. I want to be the magnanimous guy. I want to take sure. the high road. But like, dude, you just paid her for sex for for a night. You, you What high road do you have here? <laughs> Like, like you just, well, I mean, she mentions that in the, when they're showing the houses. Right. And she's like, he's like, he basically says, I want you, I yeah. want to be with you. And she's like, you can't be with me. There's, there's no, I think I had that note. Like there's nowhere to, there's nowhere to go. From there's here. nowhere to go yeah, from, from here. Where yeah. We started. Yeah. From where we started. Because from where sense. we started, we've got nowhere to go. Right. Right. And I think that's, that's a great line. And that's her. And his counter and his counter to that. It was like, I've never started. I've never started from that position before. Like he's never done this before. He's saying, "Sure, yeah, you know what I mean." Like been with somebody and just can't stop thinking about her, is in love with her, wants to be with her, that kind of thing. But I think that's because they don't. I don't think like. But then they start again in that moment. I think, and then he opens up about the woman on the the, the subway train, and you know he goes to her school, and he's he's fighting for her. And um, is it David? How do I already forget his name? David. Yeah, David. Because he's because he's the bum. He's the bum. So David and David doesn't fight for her. And I think my one scene I don't think on the level is David freaking out at the end in the in the house scene before they leave each other. When he's like, Was was he better? Was he good? Did you, oh, enjoy, right. it? Did you enjoy it? And he starts yeah. like pounding the door and his glasses fall. Like, blah, 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 blah. You asked, you asked. Yeah. If he was just like mad and he left or he threw another bottle and walked out, that would have been way more believable. But his stupid little temper tantrum came out of left and like Yes, you're a loser, dude. At this point, like that made me go, just just go to the rich guy because this guy is, <laughs> is clearly unhinged. Like that's that was such a stupid outburst. I'm like, I don't that I don't know who chose that action. If that was Woody Harrelson or the director or that was in the script, but that was that was I that I didn't like. I didn't think that was on the level. But also, yes, him giving away his million dollars, which he does not have a million dollars. Because his lawyer friend Jeremy took 5% because they draw up a, con a sex contract, which is another funny scene where he's like, the John Garfield clause. Well, that's if you die in the act. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he got 5%. So that's $20,000 already gone. Right. Like, or, yeah. Uh, what You don't have a million dollars. Now you just, you're in the hole again, you moron. You just gave a million dollars to a hippo you don't have. No, well, he never wanted the money, Butler. He never wanted it. He better run. He better run. That's just a verbal contract. <laughs> Get out of there. Uh, you mentioned the scene when uh, Gage, Robert Redford, is telling the story of the woman he saw on the subway when he was younger. And and so the note I have here is that they never told Demi Moore that that monologue. He did that monologue to her oh, in that cool. scene. And she's actually crying from um, his story, that, his he's story that he's telling. Now that goes nice. to that goes to obviously Robert Redford's a fantastic actor, and I will have I will have none of it 
people telling me he's not. He's so good. I don't think nowadays anybody says he's not a good. I think maybe back when he was like you were talking about, like right. he was the Brad Pitt of his time. Right, right. Just oh, a pretty, pretty boy. But I think now, I think. But his acting style is so different. It's so. It's not lazy and it's not casual, but that, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's measured, but it, he is such is like with it, Paul Newman, like talking about Paul Newman. It's casual. Well, you know what but I mean? But it's casual and like, it's, that's his style. Right. It's so good. But it, that's what I'm saying. But I'm saying that when you're watching them, you're not like, I'm watching somebody act. You're not, you're just like, you're watching somebody. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We talk you're, about with Paul Newman, nobody's fool. We talk in other movies. It's Redford's the same way. Well, I think that's what makes Redford, you know, a great Gatsby. I think that's what makes him great in this <laughs> film. Funny. <laughs> uh is just that you're you're drawn to him. He's got that charisma in any role he is. Like I'd sleep with that guy for a million dollars. I mean, come on. Like he's just exudes that kind of you say you're, you're, you're of charm. So you're the bottom. <laughs> I mean, it depends on how much he's paid. Whoa, whoa, you just said for a million dollars. I think we've got our number, guys. No, it's gonna be more than a million. That's 1993 million. Oh, okay. which is worth only like 1.5. No, it is worth. Hold on, I got it. It is worth two point one six nine so that's eight eight two. So that's your number. Two point two million dollars, gentlemen. Two point two million dollars, <laughs> and Mike Butler is yours for the night. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, you laugh, but if you get offered, I mean, are you gonna say no? Are you Robert Redford? <laughs> okay, all right. Are you nineteen ninety three Robert Redford? You have to call them Robert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my father's name. That's what I have. <laughs> Listen, if you didn't think that this episode was gonna go here, then you don't know <laughs> us. Um, so, but my point about the story about. I wanted to say was yes. One of my points is Robert Hoover's a great actor. The the time he tells the story. I love that note. But Demi Moore is also showing you that she's got what it takes because she's listening and she's reacting to something. Oh yeah, in absolutely. The I mean, and that and and that takes, will tell that you, takes almost more acting than right. actually acting. That's that's a big part of acting. It's not just saying your lines right. It's listening and responding to the person that's talking to you. Being in the moment, being in the yeah. scene, and not being the person talking or not having right. a the focus on you and knowing what to do with yourself yeah, and being in the moment mm -hmm. is incredibly, incredibly difficult. It's probably the most important thing you learn in any acting class mm -hmm. because it is really hard. Not just be like, my line's coming up. What am I getting for new today? Well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's probably when first people this. first start out and they don't learn the craft and they're learning it. Yes. I'm sure that's what it is. And you have to break that habit. You have, yeah. And honestly, it's a, it's a muscle. It's a skill. You know, like, uh, you know, like when I first started doing like goofy stuff back in the day, that's what it was. And I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm not read for anything. I'm not even saying I'm like, but like, I'm definitely <laughs> different right. than I was. It's a goddamn right. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, you know, obviously you kind of learn what what works and doesn't work. Sure. You can, yeah. You have to, but you have to flex it. You know that you have to flex that. So if you like that scene as well, if you see this movie and it sounded familiar, that's because it's taken from uh, a similar speech in Citizen Kane. So like that scene, he, that, that <laughs> kind of like the, the encounter he's talking about right. is from Citizen Kane as well. Okay. So I think like, I'm, I think I recall what scene like that is. So yeah. Well, that's a little, that's a little note there. So, cause we always bring this up. So when, and I, and I, and I have this, I'll read out my note as soon as the movie started. Cause I always forget this. So my the movie starts and I go, Oh no, I forgot about the voiceover. <laughs> and then I'm like two voiceovers. <laughs> Fuck. Um, you can flip that up. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was just like, no, and I'm, but then, I mean, it, it's okay. It's not, it, it's, I, I hate voiceovers. It's, pr it's pretty lame. Yeah. I, I, I when the movie, I don't like how the movie starts with like the ending. I was kind of like eye rolling, like, uh, uh, no, don't do I, I think I do that now ever since the Rick and Morty episode where they bring up like the, the flash flashback five weeks earlier and like Morty has to kill yeah. the guy because he's so annoyed by that to trope. be fair this movie's 30 <laughs> years old so that trope is probably I, overused I get it then. but it's just like uh and then the corny cheesy and we grew up and we and it's like seeing like a 30 something year old Demi Moore with like gr yeah, braces I didn't I forgot so about that I'm like late. oh my god like so you guys were kind of flirting when you were what 17 and you was, he was a senior in high school she and she was a freshman oh it wasn't even it was just that there's oh. 30 year old wearing braces I was just like come on but just still, hire younger I go actor. back to the fact that he's a senior and she's a freshman but they didn't like, date they just kind of no, liked each but still, other but still but still it's, it's come on still <laughs> um <laughs> So I had talked to you about, because I had talked to you like, oh, I was trying to watch this movie, but 
Uh, my daughter was downstairs and I want to watch it from her because there's a r- pretty see me sex scene in it. And, it, you know, and, and oh, movies just kind of like inappropriate. For but that's much. yeah. Well, that, that's probably the one that's the most. And when they they kind of kind of get together on the, on the bed of money, which is dirty. Um, I thought the same thing. I was like, oh, I thought that, that was dirty. And then when she kisses the dice, I'm like, are you kidding me? You know how many people have touched that dice? You're kissing them. Oh, yeah. But people do that all the time. Well, don't blow but Yeah, up. it is gross. Really? Really? In the time now, 2024, you're kissing dice in Las Vegas? Ma'am. I don't know where that dice is. Look at this sign. No kissing well, my, dice. My point was I wanted to get to the sex scene in the kitchen. They're really going at it in that sex scene in the kitchen. She grabs his junk. That, I was going to ask you. Shot. She yeah. actually does. Yeah. Yeah. And so the note I have is that Woody Harrelson was very nervous about that scene because he's good friends with Bruce Willis. And I Debbie saw that. Moore, yeah. And he didn't want to. He's like, listen, you're in that scene. You're, you're steamy. Things are going to happen. You're going to get excited. And like he was and he's like he was extremely like concerned about that, which I which it's funny because you don't now they have intimacy coordinators and stuff like that. So I guess it becomes a little bit more technical. Yeah, you probably are talking about certain things. So it's probably very in the moment. It's very difficult. But I feel like they were just like, all right, we're going to run the camera roll. Can you guys start making out? Yep. And it's like. I feel like that's a lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of actors have talked about how it's awkward, even like doesn't matter if you're like the hottest person in Hollywood smooching with the other hottest smooching. person in Hollywood. It's still going to be aw- you still got cameras. Mm-hmm. You've got 100 people watching you, judging you, looking at how you're doing everything. And it's just like it's such an intimate thing mm-hmm. that it's no, no matter how you think about it, no matter who it is, your partner or scene partner isn't there. It's going to be awkward. But there's some stuff like you said. There's the, he she grabs him. I, when I saw that, I'm like, she grabbed them. Like yep. that's she grabbed it. Yeah. Um. You know, I just. I mean, it's uh, as an actor. I mean, I I don't know. How you don't like awkward moments. Like are you telling me, like you're able to do that. I mean, you obviously I've, are getting paid money, but you know what I mean. Like I've had to okay do, with that. I've had. She's not that. Oh, she didn't. <laughs> um. I've had to do awkward things on stage. Yeah. And it's it's. Hey, I'm in like, hey, at least I'm in the new Adrian Line film. Um, I have to have sex with four <laughs> people, though. You cool with that? Yeah, like it's 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 not easy. It's tough. It's awkward. Yeah. It's like I remember one I, I have to get like basically one thing I did, I had to basically get raped by a guy. Mm-hmm. And we just it took forever to get that rehearsed. Like we just laughing so awkward between yeah. the two of us. Yeah. I, we did it and then it was cool after we like rehearsed it, it was like whatever, but like it's it's weird. And like, people are watching you and it's just kind of like uncomfortable. It's hard to do. Yeah. No, I hear you. So that takes a lot of, it takes a lot of work. It's, it's a, it's a lot of, uh, coordinate. Like it's good that there's intimacy coordinators now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you're like, you said, it's like a stunt. It's almost like stunts. Now you have to, I'm going to move here. You're going to move there. We're going to do this, you know? Okay. What will yeah. I do this? I'm going to turn around and do this. We don't want to show too much. So we're going to make sure you cover up, but like stuff like that. I know and, a lot of people, yeah. yeah, I think it makes it everything less steamy and sexual, but it probably makes the actors more at ease. Uh, it, it, it probably makes it in like when they're performing it steamy and sexual, like it doesn't make it as, but like yeah. it's, it's, it's beholden to the director and the cinematographer exactly. and the music and the composer to kind of, to to make it that way, but it yeah. also helps make your vision of that scene more complete. Instead of just being like, "All right, now go to it." Right, you get what you want, which you know, like, or in, if you want, like, what when Roadhouse when we reviewed it, you you put them against a hard stove and you try to yeah. <laughs> have sex on the stove. Oh, the, no, when when they're it's on the, the chimney, rocks. the rock. Uh, oh, so that's, <laughs> like that's not comfortable. Um, speaking about near the kitchen scene. Okay, go ahead. The fact that he puts his shoes on the table like yeah, that stupid. is probably a reason in and of itself for her to leave him. Yeah. Don't go back with this guy. That is disgusting. How about the fact right next to where he's eating and they're covered how, in dirt? How about the fact that after she spends the night with John Gage, he kisses and, her? No, no. Because that's gross. <laughs> Did you take he a shower for it? He wipes the lipstick off. I don't want the lipstick on you. No, no, no. Uh, when they're back at the house, she's like, hey, can you come help me in the garden? He's like, yeah. And and the next scene he's out there sitting, sitting, on, steps the, sitting on the steps. Her. Number one, not helping her. Number two, how about you mow the grass? Like, I'm sorry, but like it it's not like it's a little high. It is like this high off the table. <laughs> like I do something, dude. What I love is she goes, How about these tomatoes? Such good tomatoes. Two tomatoes are good. The three on the bottom of that basket are rotted with black marks on them. I'm like, what is this? Good tomatoes. You can't eat these tomatoes. Come on, David. But I wanna go, I wanna go back to the sex stuff. Um what do you think about the decision not to show the Gage and Deanna night together? Oh, I think that's great because then you get like Dave's perspective of you don't know. Was it good? Was it not good? You you insinuate like, yes, she slept with him, even though he had 
even though he flipped tails, she still chose to do it. Which you find out later that that um, quarter was tails. Double sides. sides yeah. yeah. Take my lucky coin, which is I can't remember what movie that also is in. That's in another movie. So I, I think that works because you don't know what they did that night. You mm-hmm. don't have an idea of if she enjoyed it, if she hated it, mm-hmm. um, if they well, she went tells through him, with it. She tells him she liked it. Eventually, yeah. yeah. So you you are with David in that frustration of like maybe us as the audience is more our interest in seeing it is a little bit more voyeur voyeuresque, a little bit more like a I don't want to say perverted need. I think voyeuresque need, I guess is the best way to put it, of like what happened? Well, why don't we get to see it? But that kind of adds to David's frustration of, I need to know. I just need to know for my release. I need to know. Mm. Uh, so I think that helps. And then you get her line and that like that. It's 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 a really well done scene up until his temper tension. Mm-hmm. This, this movie does a great job of presenting, quote unquote, the proposal. Mm-hmm. It plays out. And then this is what happens. It's almost like if you chose door number two, like this is what happens. And like, you know, like, could you like and it? And it's an interest. Like, you know, we joke about it at the beginning, but, you know, it's always that. Would you like, let's Could you? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, like now you said 2 million, let's say 5 million now. Like I feel like it need to be higher. Yeah. But still, but because that's the just, thing. Just, it's not future, high. Yeah. It's, it's high, but it's not high enough. That's why 1 million is good back then. I think now yeah. I, I would say like 2 million now. Let's like, cause you just said it would be 2 million. It'd it's be like worth 2 million, but. I don't know if two million would, would it be worth it because as- you could because this, that's that's the thing. See, yeah. that's why this movie is intriguing. That's why this movie is a six grossing film movie because you're sitting well, here going like maybe this, maybe I would do this. I don't know. Maybe well, he mentions one million. It's enough to live off of the rest. Of, like two million yeah. isn't even enough to live off of the rest of your life. Now right now, well, comfortably. You're invest- he says he says Listen, comfortably. You're investing one point five million of that. Oh yeah. Now and you take yeah, yeah. and your five hundred thousand dollars to pay off your stuff and to live, do what you need to do. But you're going to live off the interest in the investment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the question is, brother, would you? For that high enough price, so let's it's not my up. choice. Let it's me, like it wasn't okay. Let me, let me get a millionaire. Let me get somebody. Let me get somebody that's extremely good looking. <laughs> um, who does the least like as an actor? Um, no one has. Money. How about Hugh Grant? Someone like who looks like Hugh Grant, who's rich, Hugh debonair, Grant. English. Is Hugh Grant really Robert Redford? Esque though, is no, he aging? Well, as then well Brad Pitt. Then <laughs> uh, then Brad Pitt. <laughs> okay, Brad Pitt. Runs into you at the mall. I don't know why he's at the mall. <laughs> hey guys, just getting an orange juice. <laughs> yeah. He's popping over at Wetzel's. He's going to Wetzel's pretzels. He's a big Wetzel pretzel guy. Cinnabon. Eating a Cinnabon. In the- Honestly, you know. Because he's always wh- eating his yeah, movies. Saying, you could totally think of the Ocean's it. films. Like I could just picture him sitting in the middle of a, of a mall eating a Cinnabon. Like getting it all over himself. <laughs> Sees the least with you. <laughs> Says, Can my, do you mind if I borrow your fiance for the night? What What are you saying? It's up to her. Oh, so you so so you're willing to say so it's a yes for you if she says yes. It's never a no. If it's life changing money, I said it was two million. We said it was two million. But you said it was two million. I'm, I'm saying it's two million. I'm saying I w- I liked your five before. Like so, you're saying at five million, you're telling at least go. No, I'm saying it's. You up hear to, this? I'm saying it's up to her. It's not a the choice of. It's not David's choice to make. Yeah, but also she like in the end she's like we both decided it was really always her decision. She yeah. was just kind of like. But we could do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Like she like she wanted to do it to begin with, I, I think. Oh, well, you know what? Well, yes. Um, I'm I'm half joking. I don't you don't need to tell me, you know. I got you. But yes, when they're <laughs> in bed together, she brings it up and she's like, I'll do it for you. And it's like, why are you saying that? Like, yeah, and then de- she's like making that's, other that, points on like a, why she should do it. That's a really underrated scene because you you know it's they're not really saying a lot, but they are saying a lot because she's like, you know, if you want me to, I will. They're and, deciding. They're right. They've decided, yeah. So that's a really good, that's a, that's an underrated scene in the film because it's, you're right. She, she kind of wants to because she wants the money and she doesn't think it's a big deal because she tells him it's just sex. It's not love. And, yeah. And she doesn't think it's, a, and then you realize like they're, they're 26, like she's 26, he's 28, 29. Like that's the age it's supposed to be. Cause she's like, it's been six years since okay. they were married and she, they got engaged at 19. 19 so yeah. maybe they're 27. They're under tw- in their twenties. Yeah, so they're at a point in their marriage where, like, you know, talk about the seven year itch, and you, you know, you kind of like you, you've been with somebody for so long, right? They're at that point in the marriage where you know maybe it's a, it's a, it's something different, it's something new. I like the fact that they don't; they're not a couple that isn't in love. Like, I like the fact that they don't. That's a couple that is strongly in love, and their bond is tight, right? It's not a couple that you know they do have fights, but it's not really. Uh, it's not crazy, serious. right? Yeah, because I think it doesn't work if it's if it's if they're kind of already uh, up in the air together, you know what I mean? Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Then yeah. it's not as serious. Yeah. Here's this note. We both love Robert Redford. The writer, Amy Holden Jones said that while Redford was superb in the movie, 
She wondered if it would have been an even better movie if they cast an actor who was less than a perfect guy. Her suggestion? Danny DeVito. <laughs> like, that's a hard no right there. That's I, a Yeah, that's like, the, come on. The wife's not going to say mm-hmm. yes to that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's like, all right. No, the whole the whole point is that David doesn't know if it was more than what it was. Mm-hmm. That's that's maybe Danny DeVito. If the movie was ends on yes or no for that much money. But the movie is not about that. It's about what happened afterward. And if David feels like he was man enough and if she doesn't just deserve someone more like Robert Redford, right. that completely changes what the movie is about. And I think she comes back after having sex with Frank Reynolds and says, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was out there blasting. <laughs> And uh, she goes, oh, no, it was just for the money. And then she walks like, that's how that ends. <laughs> <laughs> for those that don't know, Mike's referencing. Uh, always sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah, DeVita's character that's always sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> You'll like this note. So this is one. This is a movie when it was released on VHS in 1993. It was the first, pre- the first pressing cassettes of the VHS cassettes were colored green. And Paramount did this for five movies um, in the 90s. So this was green. The the Humphrey October came out as red. I have my parents have that VHS. Ghost yeah. was white. Godfather Part Three is gold, and the firm is blue. So oh, the first cool. time those these those those VHS cassettes came out, they were different colored. The first pressing, not the second. My uh, parents have Ghost. I don't remember it being white. So they might not have yeah, the first pressing. The first, but yeah. they, their Humphrey October is red. Yeah, so yeah, sure, yeah. So I thought that was interesting. No, I'm like, oh, that's that's neat. That's cool. <laughs> they don't they don't do that anymore. You can't color the Blu-ray discs. Well, you can. The oh, top. That, that's not true. Some of the Blu-rays, PlayStation right. Blu-rays are blue. So, yeah, you're right. You can color the tops of them, yeah. Um, My Ninja Turtles movie was green. God, always gonna bring <laughs> the up the turtles. turtles. Always got to bring up the turtles. <laughs> <laughs> it's what the people want. Not, not for this film. <laughs> Nobody wants to know if uh, April was offered a million dollars if she'd sleep <laughs> with one of the turtles. <laughs> um, did you, Lynn, uh, excuse me, Adrian Lyne, uh, Completed post-production of this film two weeks before the film's release. Two weeks before it would, it would set to be released. That hard Can to you edit? imagine <laughs> being the, the 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 guys in the print studio for the film being like, is this movie coming out? Because we have it's gonna take a while to print these films. Have them print <laughs> all those reels that get sent out to all the stu- to Back all the theaters. Box. Yep. Could you imagine that? Like the pressure they were under? Could you imagine the theater not getting it? <laughs> no, I know, right? Well, we were going to have these proposals for a midnight show, but I don't even know if they did midnights back Probably then. not. No, they but... did. 93, they did. Like Thursday night midnights? No, they did because... I don't think they would have done it for a film like Indies no, and Proposed. That's were. back then they were doing only huge films like Jurassic Park would maybe get it. Well, now they do every film. Yeah, every now film. everything gets in there. Yeah, movie. yeah. In 2018, Paramount Players said that they were going to remake this film, but they never really. I don't think, I assume that's not happening. You could remake this film. Oh, no, totally. Because I think you should. Like we were talking about how they're doing Presumed Innocent. And I think I read that they're changing it up a little bit to keep you guessing. It's a TV show now. Yeah. But you could absolutely do this film as well because you could change like they, like you said, the novel was more about Arab Jewish relations. Hell, you can put you can make the guy more like Danny DeVito. You can up the money, Anthony. I think you have to. I think. Yeah, I think you have to. You have to make it relatable to current state of affairs. Sure. So you have to make it something where. Um, I think you have to play with the generations a little bit, like Gen Z versus boomers or something like that, or Gen Z versus older millennials, like something like that. Like you have like sure. just add that element to it, I think. Because this right now is just a young couple and a rich guy, an old rich guy. You know what that's but there. You can play with a lot of stuff yeah. with this. Yeah. But I mean, you, I mean, this is a perfect uh, pit, uh Brad Pitt vehicle. Perfect for him now, because he's in his mid fifties. It'd be it'd be yeah. it'd be just, I mean this would be like a role that he would easily could slide into this and it would make a ton of money if you have the right, if you have yeah. two like young popular actors and actors two actor actors that are really hot right now really popular in there with and then Brad Pitt and it's it's like a, an erotic sex thing now granted Brad Pitt I could also see Clooney granted I don't yeah. know yeah I don't know if the current state of Hollywood in terms of the films that are being made. And what the audience's um, appetite for if this type of film would really hit. Because I don't know if this is something they don't want or they do want. Well, lately, and I, I've read a few articles that like sexual things in films and movies and 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 even like something as, as simple as like kissing scenes are, are not as welcomed by fans anymore in terms of like their reactions to them, their want and their need for those kind of of scenes or footage or anything like that. So it probably isn't anymore. And but I will you, argue this, though. Yes. I will argue this though. 
you have to stop making content based upon what your focus groups are telling you. Oh, absolutely. Because then you'll never make true art. You'll never make like the next big thing. Listen, we're the audience. We're cut. We're the customers. And the customer's not always right. Customer sometimes doesn't know what it wants. Do you think when a decent proposal came out, they were expecting this type of film that they were like, oh, this, I really want a movie where the so-and-so happens. And <laughs> I want no. a rich guy to offer. Like, so that's the thing. Like, like, Focus groups are a certain group of people that you don't like they they're, they should not be dictating what your content is. And I think that's a big problem with modern Hollywood and studios and and mainstream stuff. It's content that they think they're generating to that they think people want. Whereas when you have indies, this is why I love independent films. Indies are making stories they want to tell. And I think there's a very real case for that to just to tell the stories you want to tell and your audiences will come to that. I think yeah. when you start making stuff for focus groups, you start making the same stuff. You start making homogenized stuff. You start making stuff that nobody wants to watch. And it's just, eh, it becomes mediocre. It's eh, whatever. Like we talk about all the time. Yeah. Like there is like, you know, there's oh, it used to be like big chunk of films that are really great. And there was maybe some mediocre ones. And there's like, you know, not so good ones. Th that mediocre chunk is bigger now. And it's just, yeah. it's really just, it's, it's, it's too bad. Cause I hate watching films and I'm just like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I would love to watch like Indecent Proposal. This is the type of movie you watch and this is the type of movie you talk about for a week and you bring it up with your friends. You'd be like, did you see this movie? It's just, I don't, would you do this? Like, that's like, that's the type yeah. of films you, you, you want. That's the type of films you want to think about a movie that you watch, you know, weeks ahead, weeks beyond. You tell other people and then it gets word of mouth. Like, that's, that's what makes great films. And I'll get off my soapbox, but still <laughs> tell the stories you want to tell. I didn't realize that, uh, going back to the movie, I didn't realize that Ordinary Love is from this movie. Oh, little Sade. Yeah. Yeah. And then the. Uh, How about the saxophone lady popping up <laughs> when they go to Vegas? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, get out of here. There's only one dude in the. There's only one dude that should be doing the saxophone. Is that just the guy from the Lost Boys movie? All right. <laughs> and then there's the uh, the soundtrack, though. Like the theme for this movie, I feel like played in a lot of trailers back in the day or something. Because the score for the movie sounded really familiar. And I've absolutely never seen this. Oh, movie. yeah. No, the score is very recognizable, very noticeable. It's been in trailers. Yeah. You can, when you hear it, you're like, I've, I've heard that before. Yeah. It's in a lot of stuff. Yeah. No, the music, and the music's great. The it music's is great. great. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's get into some, uh, let's get into some reviews. Reviews. Because, yeah, I right. mean, we are like pushing an hour now, which is great. Because this is, this is a movie that's like, there's a lot to talk <laughs> it's about. It's going to be another abyss edit. <laughs> so, obviously, this film, this film got a lot of flack from, uh, from feminist groups and just because it promoted, they were saying it promoted prostitution. It is. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a touchy subject and, and I can understand, you know, but that's good that it rattled. Right. Feathers. So, but, but, but I, let me reference the screenwriter who is a woman, AB Holden Jones. And she talks about when the film was released, we'll get to the credits. We'll get to the, the reviews. reviews. When the film was released, it caused a great deal of controversy because you know, how could I write this thing about a woman spending the night with this guy for a million dollars? The idea that a woman should not be tempted by any of those things, or she should be so pure that you can't make a movie about her feeling that way. I mean, she, she goes, I mean, go watch some French cinema. It's more complicated than that. I'm as big a feminist as you'll find. But part of feminism for me is that women can be portrayed not as visions of perfection on screen, but as whole human beings with choices. And oh, snap. <laughs> Mic drop. But yeah, no, that's I mean, that's legit. You, know, yeah, you, can't, absolutely. you can't. Yeah, you can't have it one way or both ways or you can't be like, you know, I, I completely understand that. You know, yeah. um, I like I always ride with my wife and, and, and when we're some places or she's cutting the grass or she's doing whatever. And my dad or somebody will be like, Oh, why are you let her do that? Go, Cause she wants to, you know, like, like I, I, well, I, you shouldn't let her do that. Go. She, she, no, she, she, <laughs> that's what she likes to do. Or she likes to build things in the house. I don't, I'm not a builder. That's what my wife does. And it's like, I don't, I don't get offended. And, I, and it's not my place to be like, no, I have to do this. No, no, that ain't your place. No. <laughs> uh, so no. So like this idea that, but also like if, 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 if you know, you, you meet a woman who's like, how it's always celebrated that men sleep around all the time. Oh yeah. But yeah. when does it, it's like terrible. Right. Yeah. Right. But it's like, no, like it, it, it's, it, it is what it is. It's, it's everyone has the right it's, to make their own choices. Yeah. behavior. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get to the reviews. Janet Mazin of the New York times wrote for all it's a ostensible, daring and decent proposals, much too cautious. None of the three principles really change as a consequence of the story. None of the frankness that might make matters interesting is allowed to sully the romantic mood. None of the characters have lines have lives outside the confines of the story. Although the lonely gauge when celebrating a big gambling win suddenly gives a party of 200 anonymous something. I can't even say that word. 200 anonymous friends, basically like what, what party 
the the, the party he had. He's a rich guy. Yeah. Of course he's gonna have a party. What do you that's, think about that? That's um other than that comment, which is kind of weird. Yeah. Um I don't necessarily disagree with some of it. Do you think that the I principles really change? I don't think they change that much. I think Robert Redford is a nice guy. I think I do think he cares for um Demi Moore's character, whose name I can't remember. Diana. Because I'm terrible D. at her names. They call each other D. Yeah, yeah. Um I did notice that they both call each other. I think that's what confused me. It's like, wait, who's who? That's their nickname. I'm so the bad at names. And they called each other the same. It's thing. not an A, it's a letter. D. I got bad with names. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, I, I feel like he he grows to actually care for her. I think at the beginning, the bet is he is attracted to her. But I think he's more interested in proving them wrong at the beginning. Oh, when he when he makes when the he makes the proposal bet, when they're playing pool. He wants to be right. And I think that's the number one thing. You think he's just saying it to just see what happens? He just wants to see what happens. He wants to be right. She says no, and then he says no, and he's like, "Oh well, that's just uh, 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 it's hypothetical." Well, what if I made it real? And then he's like, <laughs> "He's like, he's he wants just to like win, that. which works because he's he's a billionaire. He probably he's probably got that competitive drive. He wants to win. He wants to be right." Um, but I do think he grows to care for her, and they actually have a relationship. He'd like her to stay with him at the end. Um, but I do think he's kind of that charming, suave, debonair, gatsby character he was before. I think David's still kind of a loser who wants his wife back, who loves her. But he is who he was. And I think that she's always loved David, but she just kind of can't be with him at the at that point because he goes off the rails because obviously he goes insane. <laughs> uh, but she kind of falls back in love with the shoot. Once he kind of calms down, she goes back to him. So I don't think they change all that much. So I think that's true, but I don't think that's necessarily a negative. That's how I felt like the beginning of the movie when it presents the two of them. That's clearly what's going to happen at the end. But yeah, I think that that's um, not an unfair note, but I think that that's you should expect that going in when you at least again, I'm coming 30 years after being sure. like, you should expect that from this movie 30 years ago. <laughs> but yeah, I, when I was going in, I kind of knew they're good. They're going to be together. And also at the beginning of the movie. When the, the 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 bus is coming, when they if you love something, set it free and it'll find its way back to you. You're just like, yeah, they're they're getting back together at the end of this movie. I think in the original script, uh, she doesn't choose either of them. She just goes off on her own, and I think they changed that to to make it a little bit more of a happy ending. Anti feminist. <laughs> she should go off on her own. Anthony like Brett's house. Anthony Brett from the Telegraph said that despite its packaging as a steamy thriller, quote, indecent proposal is in fact a largely distasteful and bizarrely plotting romantic drama, one that gently pokes at lofty ideas about power and marriage and the American dream, but scurries away before it hits on anything too dicey. Yeah. yeah. So it's safe. It's a safe erotic. It is safe. It is a safe erotic. There's no boiling bunnies. There's no, there's no people scorn. There's no craziness. Ah, fatal attraction. Yeah, it's, it's, it's as far as erotic thrillers go, this is the tamest as you get. Feminist writer, Susan Faludi likened Gage's actions in the film to quote, essentially raping a woman with money. End quote. Is that what you call prostitution is raping a woman with money? I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I'm I'm not a woman. I I've got nothing. You're I, not. I feel like answering this question one way or the other is is not. A, I want. You I to, don't think I this want is you a safe a hot response take, Butler, because I want views. <laughs> 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 I'm just doing this for the views. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we can still keep going. I've got other notes. I mean, I've got a note where so uh, I, I can't buy your review. So people don't like this movie. I don't know. I think they think it's safe. I, I, it is safe. I do agree with that. It, I think that they, you know, what's funny is I wonder if the, the, the criticism of the film, like they're, they're all criticizing how it's too safe or nothing really changes or, but they're not, they're never, they're never talking about the actual situation. Yeah. Like, it, it, like we talk about all the time, like the suspension of disbelief in a movie, like you, you, you have to believe like what if this happened like it's i see i think like the proposal's made she says yes they do it what happens after i think that all is a fascinating tale of a what if scenario where like what would happen like 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 would this tear these two people apart is their love strong enough to survive this and he tells her he's like you know the what I what I realize is that with love and marriage, it's not about forgetting stuff because she's like, well, just forget it. It's about, it's forgiving. about forgiving stuff. Yeah. And he's got to forgive himself as well because they both agree to this. And, and, and that's the thing, too. Like they both said yes. 
mm-hmm. to this. If if one said yes, even though we talked about how they're deciding in bed, but if one said yes and one was like hesitant, but they still went through with it, then that that doesn't level the playing field in terms of the the, the two of them. But yeah. they both said yes. They sorry, they both agreed to this. They both said yes. And I think that he has to not only forgive what their decision was, not just her, but them. I think that's what he's saying there. And I think that's just, I think it's a fascinating story, just kind of just diving into it and sitting there and sitting with it. It sits with you for a week. I think like everything else, like these, these, the critics and the, and, and the critiques on it, I just think they're, it's almost like a safe thing to critique. Like, oh, they don't change. Well, maybe that's the point. Maybe characters don't change. We talk about it all the time in movies and, and I talk about it all the time in stories like, I wrote a script that is basically like this, where high school doesn't change. The same clicks and the relationships you had in high school, the people and the players may change, but your same mentality, if you don't grow sometimes for some people, is the same. You, you, you still do the same nonsense you did in high school, except you don't think you're doing it sometimes. You don't think you're favoring somebody for a certain reason or the cool club or the cool table. You're, or you're looking down on somebody because they're wearing the wrong shoes or something like that. I mean, that's we learned all that. It takes it takes people to to grow and to look on the inside and to change that, but a lot of people do that. So I think that that's so some characters don't change, and and so maybe that that's not necessarily a negative. I don't think. I think I don't know what you think about that, but I don't think it's necessarily a negative. Like the principles in this thing don't change. Maybe they they were this way, and then all of a sudden they took a a, a left turn and they get back to and they have they to get were, back yeah. to to where they were and they Which have to still find a, a way to get yeah. back to that. So I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It's just we followed this journey of them trying to figure out like where they were was the was the perfect place to be where they were in terms of emotionally and, and stuff like you that. You said approve it. it's the character's journey. That's, yeah. Yeah. So I don't I, I don't necessarily I mean characters don't have to change. They just have to go on a journey. Yeah. Sometimes sometimes it changes them. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it reveals to them that the way they were is the way it they should, they should be. be. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, we started the podcast. We quit. We realized we had to come back because you were crying. <laughs> so just, but you know what I mean? I think you kind of get the sense of what I'm saying there. Yeah. Debbie Moore and Line didn't get along as well. Did you read that note? Did you have that note? Uh, did I? Maybe. So they often fought on set over her character. And Harrison would try to be a mediator because obviously he was friends with both of them. Line argued that he wanted more to show more to show vulnerability. And the actress defended herself saying like, you know, she, you know, didn't want to or whatever. Sure. Or, or whatever. She wanted to play it a different way. And then while Lyon was he- editing the movie with his editor, he realized that the, that the way she was portraying it is what he really wanted all along. And he went and he apologized to her, which I thought was a great note. Like he oh, realized. That he, yeah. yeah you know, he, I, I like the way she portrays it. Right, she yeah. is strong. She is guarded. She doesn't just like. She doesn't let them have. The power for the most well, part. Right. She yeah. tells Gage, you know, you just collect things. I'm yeah. just, you know what I mean? She's like, very straightforward. Yeah. She's yeah. very honest right. with both of them. Yeah. So I, I thought that was a really cool note about, you know, realizing that, you know, she, you know, I mean, that's what it is. It's a collaboration at the end. You know, obviously you don't want people to fight and argue. You want to have discussions, but sure. Um, realizing that, you know, he was wrong and he kind of, she really had a hold of the character in, and she, he had to see it to really understand that. I thought that's a pretty cool note. Um, so yeah, so Mike, why is it forgotten? Um, it's an erotic thriller. I think a lot of those are actually kind of forget. Those are very much. I mean, you just, they pop up every now and then, but I think back in the nineties, the early nineties, there were a ton of them, a ton of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that they kind of lost popularity probably because of oversaturation, mm-hmm. and. I feel like this one kind of has stayed in like, well, like we said, it's in the pop culture zeitgeist because of the situation is very unique, very original. We just been talking about it for over an hour. It's, Mm -hmm. it's a very interesting premise. So I feel like people know about indecent proposal, but no one's really watched it because I feel like it's hard to put these movies on TV. Mm -hmm. So like growing up, it wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have watched it anyway on cable. It's not, you know, something a a young boy would want to watch. Um, and like it's like a romantic well, erotic thriller i'm talking like when i was watching action movies like 12 years old and stuff all right so you weren't you had you weren't hit puberty yet well there's no there's no boobs in this movie I, it's not yeah, like but a, you don't know that going oh because you you might keep watching it just to Listen, see if there were okay you watched nine and a half weeks didn't you yeah okay i get you i'm just saying <laughs> i'm just saying so 
But I, they don't put those on TV very often. If they were, they'd have probably been heavily edited. This is one of those movies when I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. This is one where your kids are just like, mm, fast forward. Can you get to it? Oh, that's it. Forget it. I'm out. That would be the movie for you as a kid. Um, like, as a young man. So, or you look on the TV guy uh, to see if they have the end listed next to the uh, oh, right. yeah. thing. Oh, no end. Never uh, mind. The Days of Scrambled Spice Channel. <laughs> <laughs> those were the what's, days what's sad, is just, what's sad is so much easier now for kids to see it to see stuff and it's like it's almost like come on you need to earn that yeah you gotta try <laughs> come on oh god i can't believe I put your face up against the screen and see if you can yeah. make anything yeah. out you need to sit there and pretend you whatever you're doing is going to help whatever see you whatever <laughs> squiggly nonsense you're seeing on there oh, i just sit here if i hit the button like this no if i just stand over here it doesn't so, work oh so stupid <laughs> So how dumb are we? We're still dumb. <laughs> but yeah, I think that it's not it, what, like that kind of thing. It would be put on TV. It kind of that kind of genre genre has died down. I think this would make a great streaming show. I think that, you know, with um, presumed innocent and stuff like that, American Gigolo just came back. I feel like oh, I never watched that. You can really do these as as streamers and really kind of get into that kind of more. I think that's the mentality can, of these I people. I think streamers is where you can find those erotic thrillers. Yeah, so. I think that's where they need to be. Um, and I, I think this, like we just said, it could be remade. But I think that's why it kind of fell out. I think that's why it's forgotten. I think people should watch this film. I think it's well acted, well directed. It's well written. It's it's nice, even though it doesn't seem like it's going to be nice. <laughs> it ends up being kind of a nice movie. It's it's a decent watch. It doesn't go for too long. I don't think. I think the the one fifty seven or two hour mark is is fine. There's definitely a place for this genre. Um, I, I'm gonna pump, pump. You're not. You don't listen to podcasts, which is a shame. But I'm gonna pimp a podcast that uh, I shouldn't say like that. I'm gonna pump up a podcast that I listen to. It's uh, you must remember this, and they did a whole season or series. We call them seasons here, at yeah. Ground Cinema, but they did all series, and one of them was erotic '80s, and the other one was erotic '90s, and it's basically talking about erotic films in those two decades. And the podcast itself deals with a lot of, um, you know. <sighs> So social issues, female issues, male issues, just kind of like how, you know, how it's an industry run by men. And it's, you know, just kind of like the bad. You do have episodes where you talk about like, you know, how some careers are ruined because of uh, because, you know, blackballing. And yeah, stuff like stuff that. Like yeah, that. Yeah. But it's but they if you like films and you're and you like Indecent Proposal and you like, you know, a, you like that erotic genre. They talk about a lot of those movies and, and, and some of them I had never heard of. And actually, when I was watching them, I would go. I would watch the movies. I'd be like, oh, let me check these out. And they're, they're, they get pretty, they get pretty like racy. Yeah. So um, I would recommend that. You must remember this and just check out the erotic 80s and erotic 90s seasons. It, it, it's got a lot of nice content. It's got a lot of nice knowledge. So I would recommend that if you're looking for films in that genre that talk about another podcast that talks about that. Yeah. There's a place for, for this, for this genre. I don't know. Like you got, like you got a little like with Call Me By Your Name that, that was very racy. I don't know if that's like an erotic thriller, though. Not a thriller. Like I'm talking about erotic. Just erotic. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a thriller. No, you're right. Um, Just like sexual. Sure. I know. I haven't seen it yet, but I know Challengers is like that. Challengers. Yep. The cannibal movie that came out a few years ago. Yeah. With Oliphant. Not Oliphant. Uh, Chalamet. Yep. Yep. So there are bits and pieces, but I think you're going to, I think you're, you're going to see a lot more of that stuff. Like uh, the actress, the, excuse me, the writer said, you know, French cinema. Yeah, I see a lot of foreign films are going to be years where you're going to find a lot of this stuff. You're going to find a lot of stuff maybe on streamers, independent, mm -hmm. where people can take chances. I mean, quite honestly, and I already talked about it already, I don't think studios are willing to take that chance right now. And I don't know if they ever will. Um, so I think if you're if this is a genre that you like, um, I think you it's very hard to find it. Um, and that's probably why it's it's and I think it's also forgot. I know we're on the forgotten part of it, not would you should recommend it, but sure. Um I think that because we already talked about how, you know, younger generations don't want to see a lot of sex on, on, on and sure, or, or, yeah. the, or the, or the focus groups are telling people that I already had that rant. Um, I think that that's kind of a, another reason why maybe like people aren't willing to go back to that. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a, like I said, this is a fascinating movie to just watch and then just talk with people about because it sits with you. Yeah. And I don't think um, like Mike didn't know. He had an idea of what it was, but he didn't really know what yeah, it was. Yeah, I really thought the whole thing was right. going to be what they want. I didn't know it was really going to explore it. Like right. Yeah. And I think it's a really, a really nice movie to watch with, you know, your, your, your significant other just kind of just 
Because it's just and then ask them, would you sleep with <laughs> exactly. Robert Redford? And then just be like, so you do, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and just to get into why who I recommend it to, I would recommend it to anybody that likes dramas, like 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 those type of films. Not looking for, I want something different, like something like that. Um, you know, this is I would recommend it for that to to people who just don't, are tired of whatever they keep seeing on yeah, TV. Yeah, it, it's really not like. If you build it as like it's an erotic thriller, most people would probably be like, mm, yeah. or like guys would be like, I don't know. I mean, in this day and age, and everything that everything new that comes out has about thirty paid people that are influencing on all the social networks that are just telling you how it's the greatest thing ever. You know what I mean? Like, oh, oh I, I love this so much. I love this so much. I love this so much. It's like, all right, I get it. But like, you know, not everything's great. Um, I think this is a movie that you know could. Uh, we're, we're, I'm saying, I'm saying, this is a movie worth your time. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But you yeah. Have, you know, that, and that's how, that's how I would recommend it to people. Yeah. I it'll think. sit with you. If you yeah. want a movie that was going to make you kind of think afterward. A little make bit. Make you think a little, a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. I mean, we already know what Mike's price is. Five million. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if you're, if you're like Brad Pitt looking, if you're so, DeVito so looking. At least, I think, you know, if I, if, if, I mean, I know somebody in the business, so maybe I can try to make that connection work. <laughs> <laughs> Paul was like, wait, what? I don't know. Right. <laughs> Why is Brad Pitt here? Brad, no. <laughs> no. And I'm just like, let it happen, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is, uh, I think the men need to leave the room. What was Jeremy say? They're like, I think it's time for uh, the good men to leave the room or something like what, that. When? Or his, his butler says it when they, after they oh, sign the, the gentleman, contract. Oh, the It's time for the gentleman to leave the room yeah, or something, something like that. that. Yeah, yeah. Close the door all slow. <laughs> oh, like in Godfather. <laughs> I know. All right. So um, that's it. That's Indecent Proposal. Uh, I'm actually happy this episode was long because I we had a lot to talk about. And I'm I'm, gl- I'm really happy that we did this movie um, for the for Forgotten Cinema because I think it's a movie that would not be done by many other podcasts. So I'm really Man. happy that we did it. Join us next week as season 18 continues on as we're going to do the 2004 action comedy movie After the Sunset starring Chris Brosnan directed by Brett Ratner. Right. I believe so. I'm this is like on the top of our list and only because you thought it was the other movie that we ended up doing. Taylor Panama? Yeah. Which I like. So we just kept it on the list. So now we're going to watch Crap. that. I have seen it before. I, Her, I don't remember I've seen it. it. No, yeah. I've seen it. I just, I know it's his, um, uh, what's, what's his, it's, it's the movie, um, to catch a thief. Like it's his to catch a thief. Yeah. That's what it is. Which is like all of Brett Ratner's films. Like it's, it's my, this, it's my, that it's family man is his, it's a wonderful life. And like, that's what he does. So, you know, we'll see that. I like that. <laughs> I like the family man. Yeah. I do not remember liking this film. So this will be an interesting watch. I just remember I saw it. I don't remember if I like it or not. To be fair, I don't remember a lot of the movie either. So I remember Pierce Brosnan on the roof at the end running. That's it. So (laughs) as much as I watch a lot of movies, I never, I very rarely remember. I remember bits and pieces. And I'm sure this will be one of the ones where once I watch, I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Or like Striking Distance, as soon as the song played, I was like, sense memory. I was like, oh yeah. (laughs) It's weird. weird. There's a lot of stuff in there floating around. Anyway, thanks uh, guys. Um, Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. I'm not going to go with my spiel because this is already going to take me forever. Who cares? It's boring. (laughs) They know where to find us. They're here. They're on YouTube. Or they're on, or listen to us on a podcast. There you go. Anyway. Spotify or Apple. I'm Mike Butler. Oh, he's ending it. I'm Mike Fields. (laughs) And this is Forgotten Cinema. This is not how I decided. It's $5 million. (laughs) 